Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Yep, second channel video. This one's going to be about CRTs and specifically Sony CRTs, and even more specifically, Sony CRT monitors made from the mid 90s and onward. What you see right here on the bench is a Gateway 2000 Vivitron 15. Well, this monitor is actually made by Sony for Gateway. Well, it was obviously back in the day. This is a model number CPD-15F23. And like I said, totally manufactured by Sony. Every part of this monitor is made by Sony. It was very common for Sony to OEM and manufacture the monitors for various companies like Sun Microsystems, Silicon Graphics, Dell, Gateway, and probably many others. I think one exception might be Apple Computer, which had many monitors that had Sony picture tubes in them, but I think most of the electronics and the case and stuff like that was actually made by Apple. But this monitor, even the plastic on the inside says, manufactured by Sony in Japan. Anyhow, the subject of this video is more to do about the mid 90s and on Sony monitors, all of them. What Sony did around that time is they switched from using potentiometers on the inside of the monitor for making all the adjustments to a connection to the microcontroller in the monitor and it required you to use software on a computer to make all adjustments. Well, not quite all, like this monitor here, if you flip the front panel down, has a bunch of buttons here that allow you to adjust geometry and stuff like that. But if you wanna tune up the monitor, which is something I often do on this channel, by adjusting all the pots for the red drive, green drive, the cutoffs, things like that, that all now has to be done in software. So the first question I hear the viewers asking right now is how do you know if your monitor is one of the ones that require software? Well, the only way I figured it out was by opening this particular monitor up and realizing that basically there were no controls on the inside of the monitor for me to adjust anything, almost nothing. There was a focus control and I found a G2 or screen control and that was it. This Sony monitor sitting on top of my 286 here is a Sony CPD-1304. It came out around 1993, at least that's when this was manufactured. And that monitor fully allows you to adjust everything with potentiometers inside. You don't need any special software to make adjustments on that. But this monitor, which was only three years newer than that one, has none of the controls. Now, I don't know if this is a for sure thing, but this has on-screen displays when you push these buttons here to adjust geometry and stuff, while that monitor does not. So maybe if you have on-screen displays, it means that that microcontroller is running everything about the monitor. But your mileage may vary. I haven't seen a lot of Sony monitors or worked on a lot of them, so I'm just not sure about that. Now up on the iPad here, I have a Sony service bulletin, and I'll put a link in the description to this so you can check this out. But this goes on to tell you is it talks about all the various monitor model numbers, and then it talks about what version of the Sony software, the proprietary Sony software that you need to make any changes to the internal settings of the monitor, and that includes adjusting all the drive and the cutoffs. Sony calls this software DAS for a digital alignment system, and there are lots of versions, it seems. You'll notice here 3.5, 5.7, 145, H1, 107, we can keep going to the second page and there's a bunch more, 101, 102, and then there's WinDAS, which is a Windows application and that's 134. And what I found and is really frustrating is that each version of the software supports a subset of monitors and it's not like WinDAS, which is the newest version, supports older monitors. You actually have to use the older software to control these specific versions of the monitor or these here and so on and so forth. What's even more frustrating is the DAS software has a hardware key. So obviously if you were a Sony service center, you'd buy a license for this software and they would send you a little LPT1 or parallel port key to plug into your computer so you would be authorized to run the software. And that really leaves the hobbyist like me at home trying to figure out a way to make any calibrations to a monitor. What got me going down that path was this monitor right here. It was given to me by a local viewer here in town and when I got it, while it was physically in good shape, the CRT was quite worn out and the picture was really, really dim. You, even when you maxed out the contrast and the brightness to 100% on both, it just wasn't enjoyable to use because of the dimness. 
If you're a regular viewer to my channel, you're probably aware that dim CRTs that aren't too dim can often be made good again by simply adjusting the drive and the cutoffs, kind of redoing the setup again for those controls, and you'll have a good image again. Maybe not totally as good as it was when it was new, because you're now gonna be pushing the CRT a little bit harder than was new, but definitely you can get more life out of something by adjusting those controls. So when I cracked open this monitor and found that there was absolutely no controls inside, I was a bit surprised and I didn't really know what to do, so I started looking on Google. That led me to a webpage that talked about WinDAS, which is that version of the Sony DAS software, the most recent run that runs on Microsoft Windows. I downloaded that software, I got it patched so it would run, and I took a look inside, and I was dismayed to find that it didn't support this model of monitor at all. In fact, all the monitors that it listed it supported in the program all seemed much newer than this one. These are the monitors that are supposedly supported by Windass, the only ones that are supported, but it's not entirely accurate, because when I ran the program, I found that a bunch of OEM monitors were also listed in the program. There's probably models that are similar or the same as these, and are just like rebadged versions. So like the CPD E500, maybe there's a compact version or a Dell version, and those were listed in Windows software. But I was pretty sad to see that this Vivitron 15, of course, was nowhere to be seen. So after a bunch more Googling, I found this PDF here that listed the various versions of Windows, which made me realize that maybe one of the other versions actually supported this monitor, but which one? I figured, like the stuff listed in Windows, this Vivitron 15 had an equivalent Sony model. I just had to figure out which one it was. So I took the model numbers that are listed here, going starting with the oldest one, because this monitor is relatively old. I think the date on this is 1995 or maybe 1996. And I started looking up all of these monitors. Well, it looked like the ones for Windows 3.5 were similar to this Sony monitor up there. They're quite old. It must have been the very first generation that had the microprocessor. But then I started looking at these, and a lot of these, they didn't look exactly the same as this, but looking at the service documentation for these, I could see the pictures of the boards inside, and they started to look very, very similar. And from an age perspective, it seemed like these are of the same age. And I actually really thought that this Vivitron matched this monitor right here, CPD-15SF1, or the X1 chassis. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but it turned out that I needed Windows 5.7, which is actually what you see running on this machine right here. So backing up a little bit, the first problem I had was that I could only find Windows. That's the version of the DAS software that doesn't support this monitor. I couldn't find any of the older DOS versions that I know existed, but I just couldn't find them. So I turned back to the viewer who actually gave me this monitor and let him know the situation I was in. And basically without the software, I wouldn't be able to use this monitor. It just was too dim to use. And he went out on a quest to figure out how to get the software and then get it running for me without the key, that is. Well, he was successful. He found all the versions of DAS, the Sony DAS software, including WinDAS. And then he went and he patched all the versions so that they could run without the LPT1 license key dongle thing. It seems that Sony used very weak protection in the software, and it was as simple as just checking the execution of code, and when it checks for the presence of the dongle, it jumps to a new location, that's when the program runs, and if it can't find it, it jumps to an error message. Well, he just made that jump unconditional, so it always jumps to the successful code, and sure enough, working software. Well, this laptop, which is running Windows XP, it has the right version of DAS on it, and it's running, and it's currently connected to the monitor, and it is working, and it's communicating. Now, the monitor probably looks pretty good in the camera, and that's because I've already gone through the adjustments and made it look good. But just to show that this is actually working right now, I'm going to hit E for degauss, and there it is. It just degauss the monitor, and I can even power off the monitor by pushing the P key because the microcontroller inside of this thing is powered up all the time. So even while the monitor is off, it really is running. And if I push P again, it will turn the monitor back on. And there it is. One thing that's interesting is while the laptop is communicating to the monitor, you can no longer use any of the on-screen displays. But if I exit out of this screen here, I think I can. Let's see if I can move this. Yeah, there we go. So that, that is allowing me to adjust things again. 
So if you're watching this video and you're looking to do some adjustments on your monitor that can hopefully fix it, make it brighter or whatnot, I'm gonna put a link in the description to where you can download these uh, DAS software, all the different versions. And I'm gonna talk about in a second what you're gonna to need to do to hook your computer up to the monitor so you can do all the calibrations and stuff that are within the DAS software. So at least with this monitor, to make any adjustments to it, you have to access the internal serial port. And that has to be done with the cover off. I remember I had a Sony monitor at one point, one that was dropped and broken and not working properly. It had access to the DAS port, actually through a little cover on the back of the monitor. So I'm not, it's not gonna be exactly the same from one monitor to another where that is. But on this monitor, it is on the right side, right here on the PCB. As far as I'm aware, it's gonna be the same pinout on every monitor. And that's because the cable that Sony gives you when you are a licensed user for DAS was the same cable to use on all the monitors. But I'm not 100% sure of that, so I recommend you try to look at the service manual for the monitor you're working on and try to figure out exactly what the pinout is. This is the pinout for this particular monitor. So if you're looking towards the connector on the PCB, so you're looking straight on, and these pins are actually on the monitor, so not the cable side, there are pins one, two, three, and four. Pin one, which on this monitor is the rightmost pin, is ground. Then you have five volts, RXD, and TXD. These are all five volt TTL levels, so it's not regular serial. You do need to convert like a regular serial port to five volt TTL if you're gonna connect a computer up to this. I recommend before connecting anything to your monitor, you check to see which of the pins is ground. And on mine, it's the pin on the far right. Since I don't have any other Sony monitors to check with, I would check to make sure that you find ground on the right here before you assume that this is the actual pinout. Now, I personally am using a USB to TTL serial converter made by FTDI. And it's actually a clone one, I think. So beware of the clone ones, which are very, very common. And here's another one here, and I'm pretty sure this is also a clone. If you use a clone one, so there it says FTDI 232 on the back. If you have a clone one, the newer FTDI drivers will not work with these. Basically, it can detect that these are clones and it breaks the chip or it makes the chip send uh, garbage data through the serial line. So it's not gonna work properly. But I am using Windows XP here with a driver from like 2013, which absolutely works perfectly with these particular dongles. You just need to make sure that it's set for five volts and not 3.3 volts because clearly the monitor is five volts and you're gonna need to have it be the same. This little board here is also an example of something that would probably work. It's serial to TTL serial. It takes RS-232 levels on this side into that nine pin and it gives you five volt TTL serial on this end. It's using a max, what is it, 323 or 232? I can never remember the name of that chip. To do that conversion, this was one a viewer sent in. This would work well if you have a desktop PC that already has serial ports in it, you can connect to here and then these connections would go to the monitor and that should absolutely work. Here's another example of a USB to TTL serial adapter. And this one is, I think it's called the CH340. Very commonly available from China for a couple bucks. On the back, it just says USB to TTL. Now I started trying to use this to talk to the monitor and all seemed to be working okay. I found Windows XP drivers for this from some website in China, had that installed on the computer. But unfortunately, it didn't take long to figure out that while using this adapter, I would get a blue screen on the laptop and the driver itself was causing the blue screen during specific operations. I have a feeling that whatever calls that the software is using in DOS are probably not supported by this driver because they probably never thought people would be using DOS programs with it. So it didn't work. So I figured the FTDI drivers would be a little bit more mature and work more reliably. And certainly they did. Now, as I mentioned, I'm running the DAS software in Windows XP, and here I can exit it off full screen. And I'm doing that because XP natively can run DOS programs. It's sort of an emulation, but it absolutely works. With Windows 10, DOS software doesn't work natively anymore. So you'd have to set up something with an emulator like VirtualBox with DOS running inside of that, and you try to map the serial port through to the little USB serial port. There are probably ways to do that. I haven't tested any of that. I just found it easier to run Windows XP and this software seems to work perfectly on there. 
In fact, it's a supported configuration that Sony had. When you read the documentation for the software, they were aware that people would be using all these DOS versions inside of Windows. And then of course, that the end version that they made, that Windows software requires Windows to run. Since I only have a sample size of one with this monitor, I can't really talk about my experience of how all these various DAS versions work with various monitors and with this FTDI adapter and on Windows XP. But this particular configuration is what worked well for me with DAS 5.7. So I had mentioned earlier on that this monitor is the CPD 15 F23. And if you notice here, I'm in the list of all the monitors that are supported by this particular version of DAS, it is not listed here. Well, originally I thought that this monitor was closely analogous to the CPD 15 SF1, the one that's selected right there, the X1 chassis. Well, it kind of worked when I picked that monitor and tried to do stuff, but it doesn't really work. The program was crashing out. It was doing really weird things. In fact, I actually kind of bricked the monitor by going to this option here and clicking UP board right there. What that seems to do is reflash the microcontroller in the monitor for your specific monitor type. I'm assuming that Sony probably has the same microcontroller used across a ton of different monitors. And maybe when you bought a specific board, it was not set up for your monitor, it might be set up for a different version or something. So you could reflash the firmware with that option. But it doesn't really tell you that that's what it's about to do. And unfortunately, I reflashed the firmware on this with the firmware for the X1 chassis, and it was not compatible at all. I really thought the monitor was bricked. I could still communicate with it over the serial port, but turning on the monitor would just immediately have it turn on and then turn back off and you'd get flashing errors on these lights. Now the software actually has a failure information screen here. And even though the monitor wasn't starting, it wasn't showing any failures happening at all. There's actually two versions of the SF1 here. One of them is built after 1995. So I tried both of those to no avail. The monitor refused to work anymore. So on a suggestion from the viewer who gave me this monitor, he said to try the 15 SF2 because why not? What else could go wrong? And I picked that and I updated the firmware from this menu here, this UP board. And guess what? The monitor came to life. After the update, the monitor turned on and I saw an image. It was dark, but it was there. So I couldn't believe it. I was just so excited. Now, all is not perfect with this at this point. There's still some weird little issues. Like sometimes, uh, as you notice when this test pattern came up, it was shifted off to the side. Not quite sure what's going on with that because if I turn the monitor off with the button on the front here and we turn it back on, there it is. Everything looks okay. It's actually aligned correctly. These monitors have the microcontroller, which looks at your signal, and there's a bunch of presets set in there for how the geometry should look. And this particular display mode seems to fall under some mode 256, which doesn't really make sense because it's just 640 by 480. And the monitor just defaults it to it shifted off to the side. Now, I just adjusted it and it seems to retain it, but then sometimes it doesn't retain it. So I'm not sure what's going on there. Originally, this monitor with the original firmware did not have any of those problems. It always had the picture aligned correctly, no matter what mode you're in. If you're going to do anything with this software, before you do anything, once you connect to the monitor for the first time, you need to upload the EEPROM data to the computer. It's hilarious that Sony uses like reverse nomenclature here, where uploading is actually what we would consider downloading the settings from the monitor into the computer, and then transferring the data from the laptop back to the monitor, they call downloading. It's very strange to me that they named it this way, so just keep that in mind and clearly read what you're about to do. But you need to copy what's in the monitor down to the computer, because if you cause any kind of screw up with these configuration options in this program, you can at least hopefully restore what you have downloaded back into the monitor and make it work. My problem is that I grabbed the settings from the original monitor to the laptop before I had it set to the correct monitor type. I had it set to the SF1 not the SF2. Unfortunately, that file it downloaded is not compatible with the firmware that's running inside of this monitor now, or probably the original firmware either. If I try to pick the option to download the file to the monitor, it tells me it, does, it can't do it. And what I did is after installing this new firmware that's on here that's running, when I download the data or upload it as Sony calls it to the laptop, I look at that file, it's over 3K in size. 
So I've actually lost the original configuration of this monitor. And when you update the firmware with this UP board, it actually loses all the settings. It completely factory defaults the monitor. So take heed of the problems that I ran into and never use this UP board command. Anyhow, for a little tour of some of the options that you can do in here, if we go into factory presets, what this is, is it shows the various programmed modes that are in here as a factory default. And there's a little reset button on the front of the monitor. If you push that, I assume it resets everything and it will reset everything back to these modes. And there's like VGA graphics, 800 by 600, 75 hertz, 85 hertz, a Macintosh mode, some SVGA, and then there's all these unused ones here as well. And down here at the bottom here, it shows you what it's currently running in. And actually, oh, it thinks it's running in mode 10 right now, which I guess is this one. And if I pick it, it says, this mode is not used on this monitor. Like what? But yeah, mode 10, it'll show it right there. I exited out of that graphic screen. We're running in regular DOS text mode now, which is at 70 Hertz. You can see that right here, 70 Hertz, 31.4 kilohertz. It's now running in mode eight, which annoyingly also tells me it's not used. So I can't even configure these defaults at all. If I pick mode one here, it tells me here to set my signal generator. Well, I'm not using one, but essentially if I had the actual Sony signal generator they want you to use, it wants me to set it to 6 quarter of 480, 59.94 hertz, you know, these settings right here. And that would be what the monitor thinks is mode one. And then I could configure those defaults. I tried to pick it and it's telling me that I'm not in mode one, I'm actually in mode eight. So that's why it's giving me a hard time. But in my software, I go into 640 by 480, which is mode one. And what it gives me is mode 10 here. And if I try to continue through to this setting, it won't let me do it. Now I did manage to get into, uh, maybe it was one of the 800 by 600 modes. I did it in Microsoft Windows and it did let me adjust the defaults for this 75 Hertz mode here. But I suppose what's happening here is it's looking for 59.94 Hertz and it's getting 59.93 from the computer and that's what's causing this. Next up, there's something to control the rotation of the monitor. Well, for this particular one, it's not really important because there are actually buttons right here to do the rotation, but maybe on the original version of this monitor, there was no control for that. And sure enough, if you move this slider here in DOS, it absolutely rotates the entire picture. It's exactly the same as rotating the entire deflection yoke. And yeah, it's amazing that Sony is able to manipulate the magnetic fields into the yoke to rotate the image without physically turning the deflection yoke. How cool is that? Next up is the maintenance screen, which is what I showed earlier. It allows you to power the monitor off and on, degauss the screen, and it has this aging function, which from my understanding is supposed to put the monitor into some mode that allows it to understand how its CRT has aged. I click that on this monitor and it doesn't seem to do anything at all. Now, before I ruined the firmware by erasing the original firmware, Clicking this did have an effect and it actually turned the entire picture completely white, really, really bright white, but it didn't seem to say it was doing anything. So I'm not really sure of the function of this aging thing. Next up is step-by-step step, and these are various alignments and adjustments you can do for these monitors. And I think what you're really supposed to do is actually run through all of these from start to finish. So you start at 1500 here, preparation for alignment, and each one of these will prompt you to display certain kinds of signals and then adjust some settings in here, which should get this monitor calibrated. Now, some of these like geometry adjustments at the prime mode, I don't really know what the prime mode means. I almost think prime mode is maybe whatever the monitor runs at when there's no signal going into it. And if you hit run, there are no specific prime mode adjustments. Okay, so it doesn't even have anything for me to adjust there. Let's try this one here. I think some of these settings probably apply to specific models, not every single one of them. Not really sure about that. So this is here, it's allowing us to set up some horizontal vertical size stuff. Maybe this is kind of a, like a default that applies to all the images. I'm not actually completely sure. So as an example, I mean, it's something that allows me to adjust vCenter up and down and it has an effect on the monitor. I'm just not totally sure how these settings affect all the geometry settings in the monitor. If you're coming to this software though, you're most likely gonna to wanna to come here to run the white balance setup. And that's what allows you to adjust the RGB drive and the cutoff and all the various parameters that will make your monitor brighter. 
It's a relatively long and involved process to do this, and I'm not really gonna run through it on here because I don't even really know what I'm doing in here, but it kind of wants you to use a colorometer to measure the brightness on the screen, and you kind of adjust the minimum and the maximum brightness and the contrast controls, and there are sliders for various white balance settings and stuff like that. But if you just go in there with enough fiddling, I was able to make this monitor look absolutely fantastic. So this white balance thing is really where it's at. There's also a failure information screen in here, which I showed earlier. It just sort of shows you if there's a failure mode of the monitor, might help you figure out what's wrong, like if the high voltage is screwed up or the ABL, that's the automatic brightness level control. So I hope you found this overview of the Sony DAS software and how it might be able to help you bring some new life into your Sony monitor, including OEM ones like this Vivitron 15. If it was, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if it wasn't, you know, all that stuff to do and this is my second channel, so it would really be cool to, if you hit that subscribe button, it really helps me out. I do have to thank my patrons, and of course all my viewers who support me. It's absolutely amazing, and I guess that is going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.